So I, my talk today is about uh, subscribe to open, which is a model um, for converting uh, subscription journals to open access. Uh, but let me set out a few premises um, before I begin to offend you. Um, first is uh, the goal is universal open access. We have for 20 years worked for open access and we have created pockets of open access. We have enabled those who believe in the public good to create open access journals, but we only have at this point, optimistically, 30% of the literature. 70% of the literature is locked up. Uh, and I don't know about you, but after 20 years, I'm a little exasperated and maybe desperate, um, but that's for you to judge. Uh, so I have, as part of the Public Knowledge Project, said that we have a responsibility, which I theme I harped on much on, on the other night, whatever that was, um, on the opening night on Wednesday, um, and that responsibility is that we can't simply provide a niche for those who believe in open access and strengthen that with uh, services that are based on communities. We need to say that if this is good, it has to be good for the whole of the literature. And if we're proposing models that is not currently, or a model that is not currently good for the whole of the literature, then we need to move outside of what we're currently doing. So this proposal that I'm presenting to you on on standalone, no, on uh, subscribe to open, on subscribe to open, is actually independent of OJS, independent of PKP in a way, and says that I need to think about more than just how the software is moving, and how this particular community that comes here is involved, and think about that other community, including the very big publishers. So if we want to have a universal model of open access, we need to address the 70% that is locked up, of which maybe 40%, if not 50 or 60%, is owned by these nasty big corporations. So in order to think about how we can do this, the other thing I want to put on the table is that we want a less disruptive model. We want to introduce a minimal way in which we can get to open access and then begin to address other issues. So if we say we have 20 things we want to do, and Catherine, I'm thinking a bit about your talk if I can. If we say we will, can I use this for a moment? Yeah. Okay, if we say we want open access and transparency of pricing, and we're not going forward until we get both, I think we reduce our chances of getting either. And I think it's time after 21 or 25 years that we say, actually, we have priorities. Actually, not everything is equally valuable to us. And open access, for me, has got to be the focus. Once we get open access, then everything else changes. But if we try to change everything, I don't think we're going to get universal open access, at least my feeling today. So, this very simple notion of having libraries subscribe to open is focused on journals that are already, not, oh, excuse me, journals that are locked in the subscription system. And to use that subscription system to get them to open access. Because those big, nasty corporations are funding many scholarly societies, have in good faith entered into relationships in the humanities, in the social sciences, and in the sciences with societies that they are now sustaining, including, or sorry, as part of their profit gouging, no question. The libraries have entered into contracts for 30 or 40 years with these big corporations in good faith. Unhappy? but they signed a contract. And so I want to work with those concepts that these big publishers control a majority of the locked up research, and I want to work with the concept that people have participated in good faith in this process, and I want to get open access. And the simple way of doing that is taking the current amount of money on the table, which is $10 billion, the best estimates, no, not the best estimates, the roughest estimates 
of how much is being spent on journal subscriptions today is $10 billion, rounded up. Could be 20 more than that, could be 10 less. No, it can't be 10 less. <laughs> so if we say that that, that $10 billion is standing between us and universal open access, how do we get open access? We say, we'll pay the $10 billion we paid last year and if that's what it costs publishers, and we don't believe it does, but remember, I'm trying to stay focused here on open access. If you say that it costs, no, sorry, that's not the right way. You have said that it costs $10 billion to publish all of the literature in subscription journals. And the libraries have written those checks. Then let's write the same check and ask for open access. Because the publisher cannot say at that point, oh no, it costs way more to give you open access. Oh no, we can't enter into that agreement, it will kill publishing. Oh no, it will be the end of scholarly societies. Because that $10 billion is sustaining scholarly societies, sustaining publishers, sustaining publishing agents, sustaining third party services, sustaining the public knowledge project in some ways because we're receiving support from some of these organizations, the libraries and others who are paying these kinds of funds, these fees. So that whole ecology is something that we want to shift. So we're to bring it to a point, let me give you a couple of examples. So we've been able to meet with publishers and talk about this model. And essentially the library receives a notice of renewal it only involves libraries paying what they paid the year before. It only involves libraries that are already subscribing to the journal. The libraries have already said in good faith, we want this journal and we'll pay X for it to be closed. We want to say, same libraries, we want you to pay X for that journal just like you did last year, only we want you to demand open access. Only we didn't have to do it that way because the, live, the publisher said, we'll do it. And so two publishers right now, for 2020 subscriptions, but right now they're soliciting those subscriptions, have sent out renewal notices that say, your subscription, in quotation marks, your subscribe to open fee, and they are using this, this is the logo, I take credit for the concept of the snappy logo, subscribe to open S2O. Check that out. You want to see my tattoo? <laughs> S2O is being marketed by Annual Reviews, which is a nonprofit organization that issues annual reviews about 35 and 35 different fields, or 40. Five of their journals, including the Journal of Public Health, which seems like an important one. The subscription notice for those five journals says next year if you subscribe at this rate, and they actually made it 5% less than the year before. Now those are special circumstances, but it makes it easier for libraries to decide. If you decide to, to renew this year, that's your only option, you can either renew or not renew. If you renew at 5% less, this journal will be free January 1st going forward. Now, annual reviews is simple, it's only one issue, get it? Annual, re annual reviews. Okay. Later. Second publisher, profit, for profit, Berghahn Books. Small publisher, only 40 journals, mainly in the social sciences. They've taken 13 anthropology journals and they've sent out the same renewal notice, only not 5% less. They've actually sent out renewal notices that are 5%, actually the 13 journals works out to about 5% more because of inflation, because they want to move the journals into this new system, and they're saying it's going to cost them more to do that, and I'm okay with that. That's typically within the range. We see 5 to 7, 3 to 7% increases for journals. Same thing. Now, what's important about this model and what and the response? We won't know because this is for 2020 until January 2020 when all the renewals will be in. I can tell you a bit about what's happened so far. 
And let me just finish explaining the model to you. What's important about this model is it keeps in place a relationship between the journal and the libraries. It's not saying to libraries, we want a donation. It's not saying support this journal because it's open access. It's saying support this journal because you've already established a relationship that points to the vitality and contribution of the journal. And for the library, it is expense neutral. No new expenses for open access. For the journal, it's revenue neutral. A whole sense of neutrality. Now, you might consider that neutrality to be surrender, but it, for the purposes of my talk, it's just neutrality. Now, what's important about this is no APCs are involved. No new kinds of cal price structures, like the transformational agreements, which use a kind of APC, which use a new price structure, which create $3 of subscription dollars, creates $1 of APC, which then has to be negotiated with each country or consortia around the world. Next year, by the way, we're going to have a lot of great open access authors from Holland, Sweden, and Germany because they've signed agreements. And so Dutch authors are going to be open in a way they've never been before. But that's just not what we want. We want universal, not Dutch open access. Who could talk to Dutch? Both have to pay money for the Dutch treatment. Or English would have an expression about the Dutch. So the other thing that's interesting for me, at least, is it doesn't disrupt the whole structure of marketing of journals. The subscription agents, the EPSCOs of the world, JSTOR, all can participate in this model. Because the subscription agents that sell the journal to new libraries have the same incentive they had before. But it becomes even easier to sell journals to new libraries on a subscribe to open basis because you can say Previously, if a journal didn't, if the library didn't subscribe to a journal, there was no use of the journal in the library. With open access, all of a sudden, libraries are using journals. Annual reviews tried this out for one year with the Journal of Public Health, and they found huge increases, as you might imagine, in the readership. Libraries were using the journal that had never used it before because it was open. It was then easy to go to that library. Now it's not a lock-in and ask them to support them. So this model is being tested with 13 journals and five journals, and this would be, even Bergheim, I'm very proud of this, you should notice. Um, 13 journals would be the largest transformation of any set of journals from subscription to open. Even scope three was only 12 journals. <laughs> Small victories here, people, but still an important one. And part of it was Berghahn Books feeling the pressure to find an open access model that it could participate in. Sage is feeling the pressure. Taylor and Francis is looking for a model. Wiley said in a webinar I was in that they were deeply interested in this model. Now this is where it gets offensive. Because this model doesn't exclude Elsevier from saying we want five million dollars from the University of California system. That's their regular bill. And those negotiations have broken down. And if the University of California said, okay, we'll give you five million dollars, but every journal has to be open. Elsevier, in principle, can't say no because like five million was good enough when it was closed. Now, you might ask about the free rider issue. You should be. One minute. I haven't got time to talk about it. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> the free rider issue is a library saying, hey, wait a second. Why should I pay anything? It's going to be open next year. I'll let all the other libraries pay, and then it'll be open. And that is a risk. But scope three, which only had 12 journals in its transformation, a paltry sum, I said 3,000 libraries supporting those 12 particle physics journals to be free and open. So 90, sorry, 90 countries have participated, those, those 3,000 libraries are from 40 countries. 
And libraries are institutions that are supporting journals that they've already spoken to the value of. And so we've reduced the chances of a free rider problem. But if there was a free rider problem, the other thing about this model is it is reversible. Burkhan and Annual Reviews have both said if we do not get the renewals that we need to publish this journal, we will revert to closed subscriptions. Mark, please. <laughs> You'll have a chance in a moment, okay? The last part of the model in the last 30 seconds that I have, and that is where are the funders? The libraries are paying the same amount, I want them to pay less. And that is to have the funders paying the publishers directly. Gates does this. If you have a Gates grant, you go to the Gates Foundation, the common system that they use, and it pays the publisher immediately and directly. Directly and immediately. And we've been working on the stats to de determine that, in fact, even in fields like anthropology, even in the humanities, there are a proportion of the work that is sponsored by funders, and we want those funders paying. For PLOS, which is looking for a way to move away from APCs, 85 to 90 percent of the articles have funders, and they should be paying to see their work, because they're the ones who benefit from it. The funders do. So, the model attempts to be universal aspires to be available to everyone, and if and when it is successful, but actually the challenge is still this idea of thinking universal, then all of a sudden the content is no longer owned, the content is no longer in a monopoly situation, and the pricing situation can begin to move. But by staying focused on a single issue like open access, um, we might get to that point. Thank you very much.